Hello and welcome to Health Live at Seniors Today. Depending on which part of the country you are in, it's perhaps raining or there could well be a huge downpour in some parts of the country, especially in Mumbai. So stay safe, everyone, and uh, thank you for being here. Today we are, uh, we've, we've moved from Hyderabad to Mumbai, to, sorry, to Pune, and we have uh, in the house Dr. Nayantara Das, who's a specialist in emergency medicine. Uh, before I greet her, I will introduce her. Dr. Das is an ER physician uh, currently practicing at the Manipal Hospital in Pune. Having completed her postgraduate training in the field of emergency medicine, she has managed the ER of several multi-speciality hospitals in Bengaluru and Pune over the last few years. She specializes in all medical and surgical related emergencies with a special interest in the management of trauma and pediatric emergencies. We've invited her to speak on common illnesses in seniors and when to consult a specialist. Welcome to Health Live at Senior Suede, Dr. Das. How have you been? Good evening, Mr. Maheshwari. Thank you so much for inviting me to talk on this forum. As I'm actually very excited today because it's a very uh, uh, relevant topic, I would say. So. Yeah, but before I want to speak, before, before I request you to make a presentation on, on, the, on the topic, you know, tell me something, uh, uh, this whole tribe of uh, general physicians, the family doctor, right. has virtually vanished. And this is something which I've raised to various people who are internal medicine specialists who have come here. For instance, I have not had um, a, a, a family doctor, so to say, for a while. I have a friend who is, you know, into emergency medicine, etc., whom I consult for whatever. And, uh, uh, and I've been doing that for the last few 10 odd years. So... Uh, is that is that something that you feel uh, has has vanished the tribe of uh, uh, general physicians and that has put pressure on people like you who are working with hospitals? That's actually a great question. Um, definitely, it's a trend. It um, the whole tribe of uh, GPs and the family family doctor family physician tribe has reduced. However, you know there are pros and cons to it. I mean, the reason why it's happened is number one, uh, super speciality is now a given. If you're a doctor, uh, an MBBS or even an MD is not good enough nowadays. So super speciality is sort of a given. That is one. And secondly, all of the information out there on the internet, uh, I think um, in patients' mind, it, to an extent, it sort of substitutes the GP. You know, I already know where I have to go. So why should I go to a GP? So you refer to Dr. Google, huh? Yes, absolutely. So that's, I, I think that is the trend more than anything. Uh, yes, it, I have noticed it. However... Um, uh, that being said, I still have seen that uh, certain GPs and certain, um, I wouldn't say um, areas, smaller areas within cities are still very, very, very much uh, reliant on their GP. They will not go to a specialist without going to their GP first. So it's a mixed population, to be honest. And uh, one more question uh, before I request you to make the presentation is, you you practice both in... Uh, uh, Bangalore as well as or Bengaluru and Pune. Uh, tell me more about, uh, you know, how is it, uh, how are both cities and which one do you prefer more? Uh, oh, which one has bad. better health care? Let me put it this way. Okay, It's a very uh, difficult question to answer, actually. Um, very much like the weather in both the cities, the health care is quite comparable, I would say. Um, maybe in terms of numbers, uh, Bangalore would obviously be larger. Um, uh, and also in the number of seniors, I have noticed that Bengaluru, you know, that uh, population, at least coming into an emergency department has been higher. Um, however, in Pune, one thing that I've noticed a very, uh, very specific thing is that the, everyone's very organized and very aware of what's happening, especially the seniors. I mean, they, you know, they know exactly what they expect from the consultation. You know, I must tell you, it's, a, it's not a great joke to uh, put, but at least you can reach the hospital on time in, in Pune. In Bengaluru, <laughs> you're stuck in traffic, right? No, but Pune is following suit very soon. It's going Pune to be as soon. So let, let's, get to, let's get to the topic uh, uh, that we've uh, you know, requested you to speak on. And yes. those of you who have questions, um, remember, uh, we've invited Dr. Nayantara Das to speak about common illnesses in seniors and when to consult a specialist. So as she makes the presentation, Please go through it and uh, put in a question. As always, mention your age and your gender so that she could give a more considered reply. 
Thank you. And over to you. Thank you, Mr. Maheshwari. Uh, very, very good evening to everyone who's joined the webinar today. Uh, so I'll be speaking on uh, a topic that um, honestly, it's quite close to my heart because um, this is something that I've noticed in my practice. Uh, a lot of misinformation, a lot of misconceptions out there. So I hope to clear some of your doubts and give you some important information today. So we'll be talking about some common illnesses and when to go to the doctor. So first of all, aging is a disease. It is a myth. It is a misconception that is not true. The only truth is that aging affects the manifestation of certain diseases as well as your recovery. However, aging in itself is not a disease and neither is it an indicator that you will deteriorate no matter what. That is a misconception and that needs to be taken out of your mind. So um, that being said, aging as the years progress, as the body gets older, it has certain changes, subtle changes in every system of the body. As you can see depicted here, I won't go into details, but right from your central nervous system, your lungs, your heart, your endocrine, that is your hormonal system, your kidneys, your gastrointestinal system, as well as your bones, there are subtle changes that occur with aging and it progresses with every year. And uh, this isn't a sign that, oh my God, there's nothing that I can do. It's actually just a sign that you need to watch out for certain things and we need to tweak the way we treat certain things. So there's nothing to be alarmed. Um, we'll just go with how you, what you need to watch out for. So certain special considerations in this age group is, uh, especially what we see is delayed presentations. Very often we see very delayed presentations because um, there's a lot of uh, tolerance to pain and tolerance to discomfort. So everyone who does uh, end up at least in the emergency room ends up very late. Uh, atypical or subtle presentations, not with clear symptoms. Um, multiple pathologies, as you all know, there may be multiple illnesses going on, diabetes, hypertension, kidney disease, some fractures, all of that going on together. And also difficulties in uh, getting an accurate history. Um, for multiple reasons. One is in, of course, the elderly above 70, 75, there may be a level of dementia, or we may not be able to get an accurate history, or they may not be able to communicate to us what exactly is going on, which is why we need a very comprehensive uh, evaluation. Uh, an evaluation for a younger adult may just involve a history and an examination, whereas in the older age group, it requires a more comprehensive detailed examination in the form of uh, blood investigations, radiology, etc. So that becomes a little bit tricky. So the million dollar question is, do I need to consult a doctor? Um, so I'll just go through a few of the common conditions. I'm sure you've all faced um, you know, some of them at some point in your life. Uh, these are the common presentations that uh, you know, you'd go to a doctor with. Uh, falls, any type of heartburn or acidity, abdominal pain, confusion, dizziness, breathlessness, constipation, joint pains, urinary symptoms reduced appetite, any problems in the vision, and generally feeling unwell or feeling weak. These are very common presentations to any hospital or to any clinic for that matter. Uh, I, however, want to just uh, talk about a few presentations, especially in my practice and in an ER that we see very often uh, that are often neglected or the presentation is delayed. And these things may require a very simple treatment to make you go back to, you know, exactly what you were before you fell ill. So we, uh, I just want to stress on these because a very simple intervention or simple treatment, if diagnosed at the right time, can you know, restore your uh, health back to exact your normalcy. So we'll just talk about a few of those. One very important one is falls. Now falls, very often I see patients all the time coming and telling me, girte to rahenge. we are getting old, we will fall. No, fall is never accepted as just, just getting old. A fall is always treated as a symptom by a doctor. Um, now in falls, both the cause and the effect are important. So the cause of falls are usually multifactorial. It has a combination of, um, you know, your pre-existing uh, illnesses along with some precipitating or environmental factor that may have led to your fall. And uh, like I said, both the cause as well as the effect of the fall are very important, especially when it comes to somebody who's had recurrent falls in a short period of time, or if they've had a fall and they're not really sure what happened or how it happened. These are uh, sort of, uh, you know, give us a um, 
an idea that we need to investigate it even further. So I'll just go through some of the uh, common causes of falls in the elderly. If you can see 30.9% is environment or accident related. For example, you tripped over something or you twisted your ankle. It's only 30% of the causes of falls in this age group. The other 70% is related to some organic cause or some condition that has caused the fall which is so interesting to see actually, because if you go through this list, gait and balance disorders, dizziness, drop attacks, confusion, postural hypotension, which basically means your blood pressure dropping when you stand up from a sitting position, any visual disturbances, sync up and other reasons. So just saying that the patient has had a fall is never enough. 70% of cases, there is a reason behind the fall that needs to be diagnosed. So that is very important. And moving on to the effects of the falls, I'm just going through the common injuries uh, that occur post the fall for whatever reason. Very commonly, broken fractured bones are quite common. Hip fractures, spine fractures, and um, long bone fractures being among the more common ones. Of course, small bruises, cuts here and there are again common. Uh, I just want you to take a look at this area. This 2.6%. That is concussion or brain injury. And that is the one that we're a little bit more concerned about. Everything else can be treated with some minor dressings or some observation, ice packs, certain medications. This is something that we need to watch out for and be a little bit more cautious about, which is why I'm just going to go through that. Now, this is a very simple test that clinicians we often use uh, to determine if the cause of the fall was something neurological or something abnormal, and not just an environment or a trip and fall. So it's a very simple test, and I believe that it can be done at home also. If uh, anyone in your family, um, an elderly person does have a fall, and he's back to normal, and you're unsure whether this was you know, something to worry about, you can always do this test because it gives you a lot of, um, a lot of uh, good idea as to whether you need to you know, get, hurry down to the hospital or you have some time. Uh, so it's called the get up and go test. You make the person sit on a chair, stand up from the chair, walk three meters in a straight line, take a turn, walk three meters back and sit down. Any, what you want to look out for is any unsteadiness or loss of balance or dizziness in any of these steps while getting up, while walking, while turning, while walking back, while sitting down. If there's any giddiness or unsteadiness, you have to consider a neurological problem that may have caused the fall. And um, that's not anything to be alarmed about, but it's something that needs to be investigated. So that's, I think, a very simple test that everyone can try to follow at home. Yes, so like I said, I just wanted to go into the concussion and head injury portion because it's a little bit, uh, it's a little tricky to diagnose. Um, now, see, if someone has a very bad head injury, it's very obvious that their head is injured, they're vomiting, they have a headache, all of that. Anyone would go to the hospital. That is a given. But what happens in the mild cases? I've fallen down at home. I've hit my head, but I'm fine. I have a little bit of a bump on my head. That's it. Why should I go down to the hospital? So in anyone above the age of 60 years, okay, even a very mild injury, like a trivial fall at home, can cause an injury inside your brain which what we look out for is bleeding within the brain. So uh, anyone with a mild head injury, we need to keep a very high index of suspicion. And I'll explain to you why. Uh, also, I just wanted to read the first line uh, that I've put here. Uh, a study actually found that 82% of people hospitalized with head injury, that is senior citizens hospitalized with head injury, went back to living, went back to independent living, back to their normal functional self when properly treated at the right time. So that misconception that, you know, if I have a head injury at this age, I'm not going to get better. That is completely false. If you're diagnosed at the right time and you're treated in the right way, very, very, very high chances that you will go back to baseline. So why are we worried about this in this age group? Um, if you look at the diagram on the left, you can see that the brain over here. So imagine this is the brain of a 35, 40 year old. However, this is the brain of somebody post 65, 70. So this is what we know call as cere cerebral atrophy. Your brain starts to shrink. So the brain mass starts to shrink. However, the skull remains the same. So there's a bit of a gap over here, as you can see that. Now, what this translates into is that if this person 
gets any kind of intracranial injury or there's a bleeding within the brain, it starts to compress the brain immediately and he will show symptoms and he knows that something is wrong. But in this case, if he bleeds and if anything collects here, this person will not show any symptoms until the bleed has reached this point and compressed the brain. And that is where the problem lies. So anyone with even a mild fall at home hits their head and you feel completely fine, but you're above the age of 65, a very simple test, it takes 30 minutes, not even 30 minutes, it takes about 15 minutes, a CT scan can help you rule out a bleed because your symptoms will not help you. You are not going to present the same way that uh, a younger adult would present. And let me also tell you that I have seen patients who come in with a paralysis because of a bleed, 78, 80, 90 years old even, with a simple surgery, they're back, they've walked out of the hospital completely fine. So it's just a matter of catching it at the right time. So which is why I'm stressing so much on this, that even if a small fall at home, you have hit your head even a little bit, please come down, come down to the hospital, get the scan done. If it's normal, great, you're happy, I'm happy. We all go on with our lives. But if there is any chance that there is any bleeding within the brain, it can be immediately tackled and we can avoid any adverse outcome. I'll move on. Uh, of course, fractures are very common. I won't go into details of this. Hip fractures, rib fractures, extremity fractures, spine fractures. And um, like I'd say 70% of these fractures can be managed without surgery. Hip fractures, yes, they do require surgery in most cases. However, other fractures, for example, spine, extremity fractures, rib fractures are all managed. If they're diagnosed at the right time, they can be managed by simple medications, immobilizations, a little bit of physiotherapy, and you can lead a very normal life. So it's just a matter of picking them up at the right time. Now, prevention of falls, of course, it's a multifactorial thing. Uh, anyone who has a tendency to fall, any gait or imbalance, vision problems, there are multiple things that we need to take into consideration. And physiotherapy is the mainstay of that. If um, anyone has any gait or imbalance issues, please make sure that the physiotherapy is happening because that is the one thing that will prevent worsening and prevent um, complications due to falls. Okay, now another symptom that we see very often, uh, especially in the ED, is delirium or acute confusion. That's what we call it. Um, now, what is this? Basically, uh, it's a state of confusion. Now, anything that um, my patient is acting off, my patient prefers to sleep, my patient is not talking to me properly, my patient is um, talking irrelevant stuff. All of this comes under acute confusion. And trust me, it's a very common thing in the senior citizen, that age group. Um, and very often it can be missed if a routine uh, cognitive testing isn't done. Very often it's just written off as, oh, it's just old age related. But it's something that, you know, if it's happened in over a short period of time, we need to look into it. Maybe a simple cause that can be corrected and the patient will be back to normal. So what is delirium? You need to ask the following questions. Was there any change in consciousness? Is the patient uh, semi-conscious? Is the patient preferring to sleep? Is there a reduced ability to focus or um, sustain attention on one thing? Is there any problem in the language, memory, or orientation to time and place? Have these symptoms, this is very important, developed over a short period of time, hours to days? And is there a fluctuation? In the morning, is okay. In the evening, not okay. Any of these things you need to think, okay, this seems like a delirium. I need to get it investigated. And why is it important to get it investigated? Because the causes are sometimes very simple and easily correctable. So a very common cause of uh, delirium, uh, one of the first foremost causes is infection. And I really want to talk about this because, um, see, when you think of infection, anybody who thinks of infection thinks, okay, I will have a fever. I will have pain, I will have some symptoms. If I have a urine infection, I will have urine symptoms. If I have a chest infection, I'll have chest symptoms. However, in the senior population, the response to pain, the response to pyrexia, that is fever, is blunted. So if I have a chest infection, I might have a fever. However, somebody who is 75 and who has a chest infection may not even have a fever. The only symptom that they may present with is confusion, which is what makes it tricky. So any kind of confusion, if we see any patient who comes in with a little bit of a confused or, you know, uh, talking something irrelevant, we first think, okay, we need to rule out 
an infection. And we need to investigate. The only way to do it is through investigating. And we need to send some blood tests. We may need to do a urine panel. We may need to do an X-ray just to find out where that infection is hiding. Because their symptoms will never be typical. And once we catch the infection, all the patient needs is antibiotics, maybe back to basement. Another very simple cause of and very uh, easily detectable cause is uh, metabolic disturbances. For example, your sodium levels going up or down, your sugar levels being down, um, any calcium going up and down, any renal impairment. These are detected through simple blood tests of electrolytes. And if detected, they can be corrected. It might be so, something so simple as adding salt in your diet and the confusion reduces. So that's the importance of just you know catching these things at the right time. Another thing is, of course, toxic in insults, certain drugs either in larger doses than they should be or interaction of two drugs causing the levels of that drug to be high in the blood for longer. These can also lead to confusion or delirium. Of course, we have to think of neurological conditions like stroke, any bleeding within the brain, like a subdural hematoma and infection in the brain, all of these, again, all treatable causes. And last but not the least, hypoxia. Something that we've seen very often in COVID, hypoxia is basically a lack of oxygen in your blood. A lack of oxygen going to your brain will lead you uh, to a lower or a depressed neurological status. So that may present in any possible way. It may, you may, may make you irritable. It may make you drowsy. It may make you either end of the spectrum. And we've seen so much of this in COVID. So that's another thing that we do consider. And again, easily detectable by putting a saturation monitor on your finger, that's it. Okay, so that is the importance of this type of presentation. Now, how do we treat it? Uh, things that we obviously, like I mentioned, once we know the cause, uh, we treat the underlying cause. If it's an infection, we may uh, you know, control the source of that infection, start on antibiotics. If it's a metabolic cause, we just correct that. Uh, but apart from treating the cause, the other things are very important. For example, we need to optimize the uh, environment um, because the patient, and, and this is not only for um, doctors, it's also for the caretakers and the caregivers of patients. You need to, in, in such patients, need to keep their environment a little bit cool, calm, and um, you know, uh, keep them comfortable because they aren't really able to fend for themselves in that moment. Good nursing care, again, plays a huge role in such patients uh, until they get better. And another very, um, actually a very bad practice of using sedatives in patients um, who are in a confused state or agitated very often, you know, um, we write it off as, oh no, he's, been, he's not been able to sleep. Or, so, you know, we'll give him a light sedative at night um, what happens is doing that without consulting a doctor is a little bit tricky because it may uh, lead to hiding uh, certain symptoms that, you know, we need to see in order to diagnose another condition. So use steroids, uh, I mean, use sedatives very carefully in patients with a confusion or patients who are agitated. Please do not um, do it without consulting a doctor first. Another very common uh, uh, presentation, I'm sure you'll all agree, is uh, abdominal pain, acidity, heartburn, uneasiness in the stomach, uneasiness in the chest. It's a very, very common symptom um, in all age groups, to be honest, but it's uh, even more relevant in uh, seniors. I'll come to why. Um, again, like I mentioned, perception of pain is blunted in uh, as the as age progresses so what i might consider severe pain somebody else might consider nothing so that's where the problem lies because the pathology may still be serious so any acute abdominal pain that is any pain that has started suddenly is whether it's mild or severe and it is persistent for a couple of days or you know a couple of hours without any relief is something that needs to be investigated so these symptoms may be like very vague you know um, you may write it off as, oh, acidity or indigestion or food poisoning. But uh, these things, it's a little tricky to just write them off without a careful evaluation um, because of the possibility of complications. So I'll come to the possible complications. Um, it's a very famous um, saying amongst surgeons that the abdomen is a Pandora's box because um, there's so many organs in there that you don't know what is uh, causing your pain and what is going to be a problem. Um, and that's why we're very careful in any age group, who, anybody who comes with an abdominal pain, we're a little bit careful uh, because we want to make sure we're looking at the right organ and treating the right organ. Um, additionally, uh, any pathology in the chest 
or the heart can also cause an abdominal pain. So that makes it even more confusing. Uh, so some common issues I'll talk to you, especially in this age group, uh, are cholecystitis, which is inflammation of the gallbladder, obstruction of the bowel, which basically means that your bowel movements aren't progressing as they should, either because of an actual physical obstruction or because the actual movement or motility has reduced. Then, of course, appendicitis, ulcers, pancreatitis, any vascular cause, that means that your blood vessels supplying your uh, abdominal organs may have a problem. Uh, and urinary infections, again, very common in this age group. This could be, um, you know, any one of these could be a cause for your abdominal pain. And again, it's very simple. All you need to do is get a simple ultrasound. And if it's normal, like I said, you're happy, I'm happy. We all go back to our lives. However, if we catch any one of these things, they can be treated on time and you can go back to living your normal life. But don't ever ignore an abdominal pain, especially if it's of an acute onset. Now, coming to one of the very important things, again, because I spoke about abdominal pain, um, in this age group, um, only about 60% of them will actually present with chest pain in a heart attack. 40%, which is such a large number, will present very atypically. The symptoms may not be related to your chest at all. You may have an abdominal pain. You may feel dizzy. You may have confusion. You may only be sweating. You may have some sort of breathing issue, but you won't have chest pain. And it turns out to be a heart attack. So uh, this is not intended to scare you, but it's intended to tell you that a very simple investigation like an ECG that takes five minutes and maybe 500 rupees, maybe even less, that can completely rule out a serious condition in this age group. So it shouldn't be taken lightly, which is why any sort of heartburn or any um, feeling of uneasiness, something that's abnormal or persistent upper abdominal pain is something that needs to be evaluated. And it's a very simple test that can be evaluated and ruled out. And I'd also like to mention the last line that I've mentioned in my slide over here, that the early diagnosis and management of heart attacks with intervention at the right time has shown excellent outcomes irrespective of the age. So if it's a 40-year-old or if it's a 90-year-old, if the heart attack is caught and treated in time, you can go back to living your life just like you would if you were younger. Now, uh, one of the last things that I want to cover actually in my talk today and uh, very, very, I think I've saved the most important for last is polypharmacy. I think uh, it's pretty self-explanatory -explan what it means. It's basically the use of multiple medications. We usually say more than five a day um, to keep it simple or the administration of more uh, medications than actually indicated. Now, why does polypharmacy happen? It's very obvious. One is this comes from you know from both sides a lot of times doctors are not able to explain in de in depth or to the patient's satisfaction why the the following medications are being started and secondly the patient themselves um, are not um, probably um, informed enough about what this medication does and why it's being taken um, most importantly would be a lack of a review uh, medications being taken, the same medications being taken and five, six of them being taken for years together without a review. That is a huge uh, contributor to polypharmacy and its related issues. Then, of course, uh, attendance at multiple specialist clinics, your second opinion, third opinion, fourth opinion. That also leads to multiple medications being started, stopped, started, stopped. And the most important is over-the-counter medication. That's another um, contributor to all of the adverse drug reactions that we see very often. Now, uh, why? Why is polypharmacy such a problem? So um, in this age group, as your age progresses, your ability to remove drugs from your system reduces. So the level of drugs builds up in your system and stays in your system much longer. So um, the the... Uh, chances of it causing an adverse reaction are much higher as you grow older. And of course, multiple drugs, drug-drug interactions, and something known as the prescribing cascade, which is actually very interesting. 
uh, very often somebody started on a new medication say and they develop some symptom they develop some confusion or some dizziness they go to a doctor and the doctor thinks it's a new symptom they prescribe something for that symptom and becomes a vicious cycle so a lack of information as to what the possible drug drug interactions and their effects could be in the patient leads to more and more prescribing and that leads to this prescribing cascade which it can be very dangerous so for all those of you uh, listening who are on multiple medications four or five medications for different illnesses no matter what they are please look out for any uh, these are very common symptoms that are put out there look out for any of these symptoms confusion depression dizziness drowsiness recurrent falls any urinary or fecal incontinence insomnia a coordination uh, loss any dehydration sudden weight loss any of these are uh you feel especially if there has been a recent addition of a medication or a recent change in prescription and you start developing any of these symptoms you need to be vigilant and report it as soon as possible so how do we prevent this of course um we advise doctors advise a monthly review for those who are taking more than five uh, medications um see everyone responds to every medication differently and some of them may need to be weaned off some of them may need to be increased a monthly review should be done ideally and uh, of course compliance to medication and very importantly transparency if um, you have taken any over the counter medication if you've taken an alternative therapy if you've stopped the medication or missed a dose please be very clear and transparent with your doctor so that they can make the right decision as to how to review your medication regimen and like i said look out for those symptoms if any of those symptoms are you know you notice any of those symptoms please report it immediately to your doctor and please avoid over the counter medication i've just uh, listed down a couple of the um, uh, main culprits of adverse drug drug reactions in uh, seniors your nsaids which are pain killers those you need to watch out for then your anti hypertensives like your ace inhibitors beta blockers diuretics all of these are things that you need to look out for again blood thinners like warfarin can have interactions antidepressants sedatives all of these can have drug drug interactions so if you have been recently started on this or the dose has been changed and you start to develop any symptoms please report it immediately and if i have any physicians um watching this uh, webinar this is a very useful tool for us to sort of uh, review medication and you know give us a systematic way to go through all of the medication and um, decide what we can maybe omit or add uh, in order to avoid the adverse drug reactions related to polypharmacy so it's the armor tool assess review minimize optimize and reassess monthly and last but not the least to all my friends who are graduates and post graduates of any of these universities uh please be very cautious there is so much misinformation out there and what uh, we often see is that it gives you uh, either a false sense of panic or a false sense of calm and both can be very very dangerous so please 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 before you uh, follow anything that has come to you as a whatsapp forward or you've read in a random article on google please consult your doctor consult your physician uh, take a review and then decide to stop or add something to your medication list thank you so much and i'd love to take your questions if there are any thank you very very much uh, dr das this is a very good and detailed presentation uh, once you've closed the chat uh, the, the screen share we will take in questions right. so you know as i was uh, as you were making this presentation i just pulled out my drawer and i found something which i keep with me pen party emodium <laughs> uh, combiflam i'm going to show you how many i've had from but you know clearly the problem is is coming over here is that uh, do we take over the counter medicines or not there are times sometimes when we are not able to consult or con connect with the doctor especially on weekends 
are over the drug over the counter drugs an absolute no no this is an anonymous attendee who is asked this question who is 65 year old okay so that's a that's actually a great question um see if um specifically to people above the age of 65 even regular medications like a pantoprazole or an imodium may cause effects that would not be caused in somebody who is younger okay just because of basic metabolism that drug is going to be in your system longer so what would possibly be in my system for 4 hours is going to be in somebody else's system for 12 hours so there is no way to predict how it would interact i think in this day and age there is always an online consult option and all of those options are always there to get in touch with your doctor regarding over the counter medications um however i would still say that if it's an antacid like pantoprazole you mentioned i'd say all right go ahead please 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 avoid painkillers that is something that should be avoided completely um no over the counter painkillers as well as imodium imodium please throw that strip away thank you uh, we have two people who have complimented you satish kalya and mr balasraj nagashetty very well explained we have a question from mr narayan rao uh, manava who is an 83 year old he says right. problems i face are uh, as mentioned in polypharmacy mainly specialist communication after corona period marketing people are running corporate hospitals i know it's a tricky question for you to answer but Uh, it's actually very uh, relevant it's a very relevant thing that's why i put it in my slides uh, it it's a two way street um specialists very often i mean they have uh, roaring opds don't have the time to go through all of the uh, prescription all of the prescribed drugs uh, but we as physicians as a community of doctors we need to make that effort to be a little bit more careful when it comes to somebody with multiple uh, prescriptions we need to have that communication for example if i am uh, treating your diabetes i need to talk, i need to be talking to your uh, your cardiologist regarding the heart medications and at least the medications that have very high chance of interaction so that that does need to happen so um and yes i agree that uh, post covid nobody uh, maybe that uh, interaction and that communication has reduced in fact doctor this uh, there is a question which is coming he says i am scared of visiting a doctor now because i don't know who the other patients are at the clinic and you're talking about ms and uh, people from with all sorts of illnesses so how can one go and be sure that you're not getting and catching an infection okay um so in terms of infections right that patients come with very i mean it's very very unlikely that these infections are airborne right these are all either droplet infections or fomites that we call touching that are um, are transmitted by touching of infected surfaces so by taking few basic precautions you can avoid infection it doesn't irrespective of what patient has come before you if you wear a mask if you do not touch any of the surfaces around you and even if you do touch if you sanitize an adequate hand wrap with a sanitizer and your mask is on very very low risk of catching any infection So Would if you, you advise uh, get masking up all the time, uh, even if now, you're going to if you're going to a hospital, you should mask up. And what about otherwise in, in general, life in general? Should no. should seniors be masking up? No, I don't think that it's indicated anymore. Uh, if you are unwell, if uh, someone in the house is unwell, has any upper respiratory type of symptoms, any cough, cold, it's a good practice either way to wear a mask. uh apart from that i don't believe that you should be wearing a mask if you're just um, you know going out somewhere not at all but in a hospital it's a, it's good practice to wear a mask thank you we have a question from mr lakshmi narayan from bengaluru who is 68 years young he says he walks on an average 5 to 7 kilometers okay. and twice in the last 3 years he has tripped and fallen hmm. not on the head only knees and elbows hmm. this fall does not get in the category that you mentioned i suppose in such situation what kind of consulting needs to be done okay so if the fall did not i mean he's clearly fallen on his knees and his hands and he's got maybe minor injuries if there is no um, obvious restricted movement he's able to walk after that if he's able to move all of those joints that's okay 
he doesn't need to go ahead and consult a doctor but even if there is a mild swelling persistent pain it's bothering you or you're not able to go back to your normal your baseline that would be walking 6 kilometers anything is troubling you you need to just go and get an x-ray an x-ray is a simple 5 minute thing to just rule out a small fracture that's it right there's a, a question from mr lakshmi and once again who says he's moved his widowed mom in her mid 80s to bengaluru from mumbai Hmm. He's found it quite odd that local doctors here do not make home visits. Hmm. It was tough to take his mother to a clinic, but the GPs here just refused to visit. It's an irony that people come home for pedicure and massage, but why not to consult? That gets so easily done in movies, where we see Nazir Hussain has a doctor Satyan Kapoor in Kathi Patan who visits as and when needed. So, doctor, this is this is a question which is there. Well, you know, I, I raised this issue about uh, general physicians and. Uh, Uh, you no, know, the lack of them available in big cities like Mumbai. They'd rather give the clinics for ATMs, etc., but not for uh, uh, the clinics. So, is this a problem that we're facing? And what what should mis- people like Mr. Lakshmi Narayan do? Um. So, see uh, again, like I mentioned, the online online consultation um, era is here. So, I. i really i do not think that it will be impossible to find any doctor for example your doctor may not be available every doctor needs his day off he does may not be available on a sunday to answer your problems but your doctor would your physician would prefer you spoke to an other physician before starting a treatment than started yourself so even if you are able to get in touch with another physician over an online consult anything anything that you can do as long as it's a physician it would be a better alternative than starting or stopping a treatment on your own or taking something over the counter that is what i believe of course home visits that's a very good point i think that um, the the uh, yes it was a quite a, a fad at some point uh, you know home visits amongst doctors now it has reduced uh, again i think it's a post uh, covid thing that um, you know even doctors are sort of uh, trying to uh, avoid uh, any thing that would lead to an infection from their side i do believe that maybe that trend is going to start uh, start up again it'll just take a few years thank you we have a question from mr bridge dukal who says his wife takes sleeping pills 3 to 4 times in a week after which she cannot sleep without which perhaps she's not so is it harmful he asks she is 75 Okay. Uh, see again, I would I would need to know what other medication she's on, and you know what other comorbid illnesses uh, she has. But if uh, she's become dependent on these medications, she needs to be again. It needs a review needs to be done. Maybe that medication isn't working for her. Maybe there's an other stressor or another cause for her insomnia that can be treated easier. so uh, anyone who starts to develop a tolerance to sedatives and uh, who says i cannot sleep without it it's something that needs to be investigated a little further especially if there are other medications going on suppose there aren't any other any uh, cns depressing that depress your neurological function uh, medications going on apart from this uh, then i don't see any harm in taking a sedative uh, for a couple of times a week however if there are other medications going on and you are developing a tolerance it's something that needs to be cut down on right uh, thank you this is a question from katie davanchi who says doctor i am 72 and in a routine blood test my b12 level was 83 hmm. uh, what is the reason for this low level and how can this be increased she has another uh, question is my husband who is 77 has constipation what will help him is the situation and taking regular cremafin is it safe so let's look at the first question first about a b12 level which was 83 b12 levels i mean um, if especially if you're a vegetarian it's uh, quite common um uh, we do see low b12 levels in vegetarians and um, we tend to you know it's again easily correctable there are um, medication you can start taking supplements initially with a low b12 we do advise uh, im injections followed by regular supplements and that comes back up and you need to correct it because it does have effects uh, later on your general you will start to feel tired you it affects your nerve function in the long run so it needs to be corrected uh, other reasons are also um, problems in the gut like you know if you're um, 
vitamins and minerals are not being absorbed the right way from your gut those are also reasons for your b12 being low uh, again it requires a little bit of uh, evaluation if you're a vegetarian and your b12 is low we'll probably correct it and then take it forward from there if you're not a vegetarian your b12 is low we need to investigate it further it will be done if you go to a gp they'll let you know what series of tests need to be done for that thank you katie daganchi is a kusrobag parsi so i'm i'm unlikely that she's a vegetarian, she's a vegetarian. But, uh, <laughs> uh, okay, her husband is who's 77 has right. constipation what will help and the question is what will help him in the situation and is taking uh, regular cremafen safe okay uh, again very good i was expecting this question actually um this age group i've noticed it's the most distressing symptom for them constipation um and i understand i understand it's a very distressing um, symptom um however like i mentioned i think in my first few slides right that um aging has an effect on all parts of the body so the effect that it has on your gi system is that it reduces the motility of your intestine so it reduces the movement downwards of anything anything that is within your intestine so constipation is very common for that reason that is the main reason why constipation is common and what um, also secondly uh, the ability to digest all types of food starts to reduce with age so if you do not change or tailor your diet according to your age at the right time you will start to face constipation so as your age is progressing you need to start having lighter meals smaller meals high fiber diets so that you can reduce that incidence of constipation and should it occur first thing is you should not be alarmed very often i have patients coming to me and saying that will i die i have constipation i have not gone for two days will i die so that that uh, fear needs to go so you will not die from having constipation you can use a light laxative take a high fiber diet give it some time uh, a constipation may be relieved in an adult in a younger adult within a day it may take three days for an older person and that is expected that is normal it's nothing to be alarmed about i think dietary changes are the only way to go uh, in terms of cremafen is okay uh, it depends on how often you are taking it if you are taking it uh, daily forever maybe you should start to reduce it because it will just um, ultimately lead to local area issues doctor i know we've crossed the time of 5:45 which is our own self defined lakshman rekha but if you don't mind i can i take a few more questions of course of course okay so this is by uh, mr sumit chand jain who's 80 and his question is i feel giddiness quite often during one or two during this one or two minutes uh, after that period i become okay i've got an ecg done it's all okay please suggest how to handle and he doesn't have any heart problems okay uh, so giddiness again is one of those symptoms that can be caused because of multiple things uh, a very common thing that we've seen in this age group is that postural hypotension which i spoke about for example a sudden change in your movement leads to a sudden drop in blood pressure as you grow older your compensatory mechanisms that are already in place for your body for example if i get up suddenly from a sitting position my bp will fall but the compensatory mechanisms in place will not allow me to feel dizzy it will push my blood up faster however as you age that mechanism starts to slow down which is why any sudden change in position may cause that uh, that momentary dizziness however if you are back to baseline you remember the event and you are able to go back to your normal duties everything your normal activities and your cardiac evaluation is normal i don't think you need to worry about it right uh, we have a question from mr brijendra kumar who is 78 from mumbai he has two questions i suffer from constipation i am vegetarian and take simple food how to improve my digestive system hmm. that's one question and the second question that has been asked by various people how does one keep old age related diseases like alzheimers dementia or parkinsons uh, which he says he is lucky doesn't have any 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 at all but but the first question is important how you know he's a vegetarian and okay. he takes simple food and he wants to know uh, how he can improve his digestive system okay so like i mentioned it's also um, rather than the actual simple food it is smaller quantities multiple smaller meals as well as high fiber fiber is the most important the fiber the higher your fiber is in the diet 
um, the easier you will be able to digest all kinds of food. It's not just about eating simple, non-spicy food. Very often people say that, you know, I'm not eating any spicy food. I'm not eating outside. Why am I still constipated? Maybe your fiber levels are not up to the mark. Thanks. We have a question from Mr. Arvind Bharat, mm -hmm. who's 69. His question is, any adverse effect of thyrocure over a long period and interaction with cholesterol drugs? Hmm. Uh, so, as far as I know, thyroid, uh, that is your thyroxin, um, uh, does not have a direct interaction with uh, cholesterol drugs, that is statins. Um, it can be taken safely together. Uh, again, I would need to know the dose exactly for that because it depends on how, uh, what dose of uh, thyronome is being taken. But uh, I've not seen a routine interaction between the two, no. Uh, doctor, we have a question from Tilokina Dube, who's 69. So Dube's question is, he has liver fibrosis. Hmm. Which painkiller is safe for people with problems? Sorry, uh, your voice broken between. Which painkiller pain is safer for people with liver problems? Okay, so... Um... So in somebody with liver problems, uh, like a fibrosis, uh, what we would suggest is see usually paracetamol in higher doses is avoided, as well as the other painkillers, what we call the NSAIDs are avoided. So we uh, prefer to give small dose of opioids. So one that does come in a tablet form is tramadol. So tramadol is a, a tablet that can be used uh, as a painkiller for uh, patients who have any liver related issues. Again, it needs to be prescribed by a physician. No, we have so many questions which I'm not going to be able to take. Uh, there's one question which is uh, which is something which we should mention again from Mr. Lakhman, but it's an important question. Is paracetamol not to be taken without consulting a doctor? Okay, again, a uh, very good question, actually. Uh, so paracetamol is the kind of drug that is very safe, provided it's taken in the right dose. Toxicity of paracetamol, if taken even one milligram above the toxic dose is very severe. So um, in, a, in the span of um, 24 hours, we say the toxic dose or what, you know, the absolute, the dose beyond which you should not take is four grams. So what we normally take would be our Dolo 650. If we take our Dolo 650 even four times in the day with a six hour gap, that should be all right. Um, but if we take a one gram paracetamol with a six hour gap four times a day, you've already reached that borderline where you will start showing effects on the liver. That being said, anyone with even a mild liver disease, the whole thing, the whole scenario changes because even lower doses of paracetamol can be toxic. Doctor, tell me, uh, you know, what is the risk of getting fake drugs? Because, uh, you know, paracetamol uh, has... Uh, well, you mentioned a few drugs, but is there is there a risk of getting a fake Dolo 650? Uh, <laughs> that's a very quite a difficult uh, question to answer. Um, it, I mean, that risk always exists, and uh, it's something that I feel. Is it better to have? Is it better to sorry? Is it better to buy a, a, a medicine from a chemist which is attached to a hospital? Is that safer uh, uh, if one does that? Yes. Yes, I would say that it is safer because uh, it's more closely regulated. Right. Uh, you know, Dr. One more question because this person asked mm -hmm. quite some time back. If I, mm -hmm. I, I missed this. is Mr. Bharat Mehta, who's mm -hmm. 66. He takes heart medicines in the last 2.5 years, uric, uric acid medicines in the last six months, mm -hmm. skin fungus medicines in the last three months. Please let me know the side effects of the same in daily life. Okay, so heart medications, uric acid medications, and skin related medications, That's right? Great. Okay, so heart medications, again, it depends on what the heart med heart medications are very varied, but um, I'm assuming that heart medications usually are related to uh, reducing fluid um, accumulation. So they are, uh, they're very often diuretics, which extract fluid. Uh, so that again can cause what I mentioned, your dizziness, your syncope, your postural hypotension, all of those things can be caused by many heart medications. Uh, again, heart medications could also mean blood thinners. So blood thinners, again, you need to be very careful. If you're on one blood thinner, 
um all right usually if you're just on an aspirin it won't cause much problem for you but if you're on two blood thinners very often people are on clopidogrel or uh, ticagrel or additionally to ecosprin of course there is a high risk of bleeding in such cases a small wound may bleed longer and that doesn't it's not something to be alarmed about it's just that you require to keep pressure on it longer or if you notice any bleeding you need to be a little bit more vigilant so heart related medications yes they have these uh, particular side effects uh anti fungal skin related med- medication and uric acid medication uh, i wouldn't say that there are any very significant side effects that um, we could talk about at the moment but um, yeah again gi side effects constipation related issues gastritis issues are there with all medications thank you very much thank you very much for your amazing presentation and uh, for really taking you know, we've crossed our Our time limit is five fifty-five now. Uh, I think we we still have questions to answer, and uh, we'll perhaps <laughs> invite you once again and uh, request you to respond to some of the questions that are there. So sorry, those of you who have asked questions, uh, Dr. Siddhi Bora, Mr. Tirunokina Ji, uh, Ajay Vishnu, and uh, who's asked how often do you recommend elders to uh, and uh, Uh, thank you very much, Kashi Vishwanathan, Ajay Vishnu. Again, Kaushik Singh. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not able to take all the questions because we've just run out of time. But uh, thank you very much once again, Doctor Nanda Das, for taking this, uh, for taking time out, and for this amazing presentation. I'm, I'm sure people have, uh, uh, people have mentioned that they've enjoyed the presentation, and, uh, and I'm sure they'll benefit a lot. And as always, uh, this presentation, this this edited video, will be there on our website. on monday evening on, along with the takeaways written by a a medical doctor who will uh, who writes the takeaways and who uh, will be there on the senior today website on monday evening so do look out for that as well as the video that those of you who may have missed the presentation or something that is written in the presentation you can always look at that we will be back once again next saturday at 5 pm with the health live at senior today and uh, those of you who would like to pre register you can do that you know the uh, we we offer pre registration for our various sessions uh, our producer is having a bit disconnectivity so i have to put the uh, link on the chat below but if you are interested you can just write to us at ttor at seniorstoday.in remember we've completed four years now our anniversary is to our fourth anniversary issue is there on the website and you can go through it over there it's free of cost thank you very much once again dr das for uh, taking time out and for uh, advising our uh, uh, readers and viewers here we will be back once again next saturday at 5 thank, thank you, you so much, much.